everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, this session is, or this program is called ADSET, and it is a program of Art and Ubuntu Trust. My name is Zipo Daile. I'm the pro program curator and host for the sessions. Uh, we're very excited to have you joining us today um, for our very first session, which looks at uh, Guma music through the screening Guma Rhythms and presentations by our, spe our speakers uh, who are here. Um, I see Dr. Valmond Lane, Ms. Nabaga Zukwana, and Ms. Atia Khan have joined us. The program at set expands on a film series um, called South African Arts Past and Present. And this, uh, this series is produced and directed by uh, Bridget Thompson and Abdul Kadir Ahmed Said. I think they're somewhere here um, with us today. And also the late Dingan Ka. It is a 15 part series and provides an introduction to understanding the roots of South African aesthetics and looks at how a number of artists, musicians, and writers have, have shaped artistic expression. Um, so with this focus on literature, music, and visual art, uh, the series um, is geared towards uh, assisting teachers uh, in classroom situations. And it also looks at exposing the deep and rich and mostly largely untold um, heritage of South African arts. So this we have 10 sessions lined up for you. Uh, we've had Adset previously in 2021, where we screened and we launched books um, during nine uh, series of programming. Uh, like today also, the sessions will take place every Saturday from 2 to 3 p.m. Um, and we have 10 lined up from today um, up until the 2nd of December. And these sessions will cover um, music and they will cover visual arts. Uh, we have a session on this drama, Brad Louis Muhulu. And a session that's coming up next week is on Robbie Jackson. And we have more sessions uh, on visual art with uh, Charles Sokayangosi, Peter Clark, Omar Bacha. And we'll be introducing some publications that are currently in the works uh, for a few of these artists. And we also have a jazz conversation uh, that's coming up. It's also a short documentary, which is also part of this 15 uh, part series uh, documentary. And the, the jazz conversations are, um, uh, uh, you know, a short, a short documentary with guest musicians like Becky Kors, uh, uh, the late Banera Chapane, um, um, Fitzroy Mungana, and uh, Dorothy Masuga. Uh, um, uh, but Jonas Kwanga also makes an appearance on the on the list. So if you are interested in staying up to date um, with with the program, would appreciate if you could go on the Art and Ubuntu Trust website and register your um, your information on the very first page at the bottom. You get a chance to register your email address and click on the subscribe button uh, to make sure that you get updated on all these different. Um, this programming that we have for you. So today, though, we are talking about Kuma, and what we will do is we will start by playing this film, the very short film, and thereafter I will invite my three guests uh, to give an introduction. Um, thereafter, we will have a little bit of a discussion. If you are interested in asking some questions, we really encourage that you do that. Um, this will also assist in, you know, in in feedback when we prepare for um, more of these like workbooks um, that we make to accompany the films. And also, at some point, please um, keep an eye out for a link to fill in a um, an evaluation form. And this form is also to help us to understand if these these sessions are effective or not. Right. Um, I have a colleague, Yone Lisa, who is in the technical side there, and she will press start in the film, and thereafter we'll come back and have a little chat. Thank you. Uh, if you have any commentary or 
you know on the film or you'd like to add here and there uh please hold the comments up until the last speaker um speaks around uh, about now i'd like to invite um our speakers i'm gonna start with uh, dr valmon uh, as a musician also an academic um, researcher and curator and followed by Ms. Nobagaz Nyugwana, a, a musician and musicologist, and Ms. Atia Khan, who's a writer and a DJ. Um, to uh, an introduction, thereafter, we'll go to a little bit of a discussion. Okay, over to you, uh, Falmont. Thank you, Zippo. Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, Thank you for this opportunity. I want to congratulate you and the organizers for this series. Um, and uh, I'm also very honored to be on the panel with um, my colleagues, um, Atia and Ngabakazi. Um, I thought I would just take a few minutes to, I'm busy. I mean, I did my doctorate on Guma as a kind of aesthetic mythical language in, in thinking about jazz in, in Cape Town and South Africa. Uh, and I thought I'd just pose a few questions that uh, the, the film brings out a little bit um, and also I'm kind of reflecting on my own work and uh, maybe that would be interesting for people to to discuss. Um, and it's, it's questions that I guess come from my own inquiries. Uh, I've also worked as a curator um, at the District 6 Museum where obviously given the history of District 6 and the city, um, this thing we call Guma is a big um, question. And I mean, I guess it, it comes from a frustration I've had in that all the books about Guma, all the kind of journalistic articles about it, well, not all, but most of them, the general thrust of it is that uh, I think the, la the way we talk about it is very limited. And so a film like this and a story like this and the work of people like Vincent Colby and others to, to kind of to try to shape and, and change the way we ask questions about this was, was a very important part of my own education and my own learning. Um, Vincent and other people, I think, helped mentor me into different ways of thinking about it. Um, and so th there's the academic disciplines as well. There's social history, anthropology, ethnomusicology, which have their own um, kind of trajectory in the uh, kind of what we now call the colonial episteme or the ways of making knowledge about the colonial subjects. I guess what I want to say about all of this is that um, it's, I want to suggest that it's very helpful to think about the figure of the slave in talking about Guma. We, we inherit the language and in, in the film, Vincent Colby talks about creolization. Um, and I think what he's doing there, uh, and maybe to make it explicit, he's saying that we receive a way of talking about this music that comes from apartheid, that tells us that we all had to be in separate racial boxes or ethnic boxes, and Guma ticks the box for colored people. And he's saying that's a very simplistic and reductionist and dangerous practice given our own history. Let's find other other ways of talking about it that opens it up. And, and I want to agree with that and say, especially also connecting with what Errol Dias, the musician, was saying about the fact that Guma, you can think of Guma like the blues in this part of the of the world, in our small little um, province, or the samba or other kind of indigenous forms. And what they all have in common is that they come from a slave economy and a slave culture. And, and I want to put that into, into the pot, as it were, to, to think about. Um, there's also, I, I want to draw attention to the, there's, a uh, I think, a helpful way of thinking about the history of this music um, in a more, I don't know if holistic is the word I want to use, um, but the, the kinds of ways, uh, really the book that I'm writing is about thinking about different strategies for talking about this and what those strategies enable. So um, for example, um, Guma music in the 19th century or, or post, uh, I guess, the emancipation of slaves has a very important connection with print, mu with sheet music. Um, the, if, you, if you listen to a lot of the um, the kind of folk musics of places like Jamaica, the Caribbean, uh, and so on, and you listen to Guma, it, there's something funny about the fact that they sound so similar. 
Um, they've got similar rhythms. The chord structures are similar. That's got a lot to do with the fact that slaves in all of those places, as Vincent was saying, um, had access to the sh same sh sheet music, the same song traditions. Um, um, and later on the records, uh, you've got cinema, you've got records um, that come to different ports with ships. Again, you've got this kind of reproduction of different sensibilities in different places. They land differently. The feeling may be slightly different, but there's a very strong affinity that, uh, that um, I don't think is that mysterious because it's got a lot to do with the fact that these are all places that were colonized by European countries and there was a print music, sheet music industry and then a record industry, the, the cinema industries in those places. Um, there's also, uh, so one is always thinking about what's, what are the strategies that we can use to counter the, the kind of resilience of race, because uh, race thinking still plays a big part, as we know, in, in the world that we live in. And we constantly have to be on the lookout for how that is helping to shape our world. I think what I want to say about um, what the film brings out very nicely, um, and it's kind of resonant with my own upbringing, is... Uh, I grew. I, I remember growing up in in uh, or being a teenager in Factoryton, and uh, I was involved in some youth activities. Uh, we used to we used to have a little sing song in the in the square, and the, the idea was to raise awareness and to get people involved in politics. But people used to come out and sing songs, and some of them were rude songs, or bawdy songs, or funny songs, or comic songs, or sad songs. Um, for me, that's kind of the the spirit of when I think about Guma, that's what I think about. It's it's just the ethos of the way communities come together and celebrate and make music, uh, and to take that as a more kind of human centered approach that doesn't think about types or or categories of people, but rather how people make sense of their world and how they enjoy themselves and use music to to enjoy themselves. Um, there's a very nice story. Also, uh, I mean, I think the other key word that I want to put into the conversation is myth and mythos. It's not to say that myths are untrue or false um, and that other things are true, but rather that apartheid is an intervention in in um, the kind of cycle of human life. And it, it, it's there for a reason. So there's this very nice story of a man called Robert Go Gonzalez. Um, that I encountered while working at the museum, uh, partly through talking to Vincent and others, uh, to thinking about the church, the AME church, and the role that it played in bringing, uh, or other institutions play in bringing cultural ideas into the country and also taking them out. So Robert Gonzalez came here in 1902. He's an, a sailor, he comes from Antigua via London, I think as many young people in that time, um, he went to find his fortune, he ended up working on, on boats, and somehow he ended up in South Africa, in Cape Town. And it wasn't that uncommon because we know now that uh, for black citizens of the Atlantic world, um, people were, looked to South Africa. Cape Town was a very interesting place, a very different, uh, where people thought about it differently to the way they do now. Cape Town was a place where the possibilities for black people were still alive inside of the boundaries of, of empire. I think it's Victoria Collis Putelezi who writes about that, that South Africa and Cape Town was seen as a place of aspiration for black people. So Gonzalez comes here, and please tell me when I'm um, running out of time, because I can talk about this all day, but I, I'm gonna try to keep it short. So Gonzalez no, comes here and he becomes part of, uh, he lands in Simonstown, Harbor and he comes into the city. You can imagine what the city was like. It's this, the first war, ugh, the, um, the Anglo war or South African war has just finished. And Gonzalez becomes part of the, I think his sort of entry into the community is through the AME church, the African Methodist Episcopalian church. It's an American, African-American church that is very strong uh, already emerging in Cape Town. The point about all of this is Gonzalez brings what we now call the Achas. I don't know how many of you know about the Achas or are aware of this marching tradition in the carnival that has the American insignia, the, the, the Apaches and the devils. It's a very important part of the ritual of the carnival, even though it's not official. 
But it's interesting that the Acha eventually disappears. And I, I mean, part of my book is, is describing, trying to think about what was happening in the history of Cape Town by looking at the history of the Acha, because it talks about the marginalization of, Cape, of, of the carnival, but also about the possibilities that were there at the time when the carnival was a much more creative place where um, you, you had these imperial traditions of imperial um, pageantry that other people have written about. And then um, as the, I guess, as industrialization happened and as racial policies start to kick in, the carnival becomes a victim of all of that. And the intellectual political class, it's funny that people like Dr. Abdurrahman, who was a leading polit black politician in the city, used to own a, car a Klopsa troupe. You can't imagine people in the kind of progressive movement after that, in the 50s and 60s, owning Klopsa troops, because by then there was a, a separation and and the I think we live with the legacy of those decisions and what were those rifts that happened uh, in that period. So that's just a way of saying that um, we have a particular uh, malaise with the carnival at the moment. It is it is frowned upon by so by by many progressive thinking people because of the blackface thing, but there's also a lot of artists such as uh, the artists you saw in the video, Robbie Jansen, the Genuines. Um, uh, Errol Dyers and others who, em who have embraced Guma without all of that complicated politics and are simply engaging with the, the politics through music rather than anything else. But I think what, what it signals to me in writing the book is that we need, it's, it's, it's as if this carnival has been an engine for generating mythical ideas about, about who we are in this place that were very supportive of community making. Um, and we've lost that to some extent. People still are involved in the carnival and it's still a very vibrant dynamic place but it's got no connection with the official life of the city the city has sort of abandoned and turns its back on the carnival so when the clubs are marched through town all the restaurants close i mean that's a bizarre um I, there's something bizarre and and unwell about all of that that i think uh, as a society we need to look at ourselves and 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 ask well, what's going on there so i think there's a lot of work to do in 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 the sense making a new mythos that is built on on something that is not apartheid, that, that something that gives us more hope for, uh, you know, all the things that we want. And it, I think it comes from going back to those old histories and to the more recent histories of, of Guma. So I'm very excited about programs and, and conversations like this, because I think there's something um, very powerful about this music and not only the music, but the, the language. You, I mean, you spoke about the language, the culture, the food culture, the poetry, all the things that go with culture. Um, I'm, I'm very reluctant to separate the music out from it. But um, there's, there's huge possibility, I think, in, in taking the, I mean, I, I think of the, you know, there's all this new invention. Um, we've had hip hop, we've had other interventions in the city that are also drawing on this culture of making community through music and music through through community. So I think I'll leave it there. Um, there's a lot more I can say, but it would be nice to hear people's responses and, and to engage with, with the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Vermont. We'll pick it up a little bit later. Uh, let's first hear from our speakers. And then if we have time, we could, you know, we'll come back to you. Navagazi, uh, you're up next. Thank you, Zippo. Thank you very much. And thank you for the invitation. Um, <clears throat> as much as uh, Vermont has um, highlighted what, um, I think he was Dr. Kobe by the time he passed, Vincent Kobe has told us about the early life of the Cape. You know, even when we teach, we talk of um, the race, the Cape, and the culture. We never ever directly call the different um, ethnic groups that made those races that were found in the Cape. Um, maybe that lends then to the creolization that we have, that it is not bounded by an earlier settlement of people in a certain area. If we look even at an area like District 6 and we read books from Richard Rife to even other people who were moved from District 6 to Ndabeni and that they were the first, the Bantu-speaking people were the first people to move out of District 6. 
So yet, yet again, they were um, not part of the chattel slavery. So there, there are always these contestations of power and whether it's given to a group. Um, we have it with the Bantu stands all around South Africa. Um, but also what we have as the um, carnival is, is what is being said by Dr. Uh, Valmont is that there's a primavera that's going to come up. It's going to play as we saw it played in the movie, in the, in the, in the movie on the piano by uh, Vincent Colby that um, whether you replace the words and you're talking about um, one situation or you're talking about January, February, ba, 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 da, ba, ba, ba. all that primavera is then that Chakni music that we find across uh, in the Americas, especially South America. And the history of that, you know, there's something in uh, Caracua they call the Altillian Waltz. And because the Dutch came, they came with their Bura dance, the French came with their dance, um, everyone came with their dance to make the dance. But the people, as it said in the movie, the people who made the music were their enslaved people. So yes, we talk about Motown today and we talk about rhythm and blues, but the people who put that type of rhythm, that Africanization in a far land to rhythm, um, if you've gone on a boat for many months, uh, you get scurvy, you get memory loss. So those are the people who survived that journey and generations of them. And we treasure what they hold in that oral memory space that is kept by folklore, that is kept by an intimate relationship with an intergeneration of our elders. And those problems then are going to be the same whether we're in South Africa, whether we are in America, South America, and possibly the Pacifics themselves. Even though not much is really written about the Pacifics, and um, it, it, you know, it's it's these um, old old spaces, and what do people call themselves in those old spaces, and what are they satisfied as economic livelihoods, but. Yes, we are dealing with an oral culture. And as we deal with this oral culture, yes, we can hold on to the orthography when we read, but are we listening? Do we hear? And I just want to make an example about a place called Utenaik. The British will say it's Utenaik. The Dutch will call it Etenhag. And the Tosas will say Etenhag. And it's, and it's got nothing to say what's the valley What's the river that crosses that place? And what do the people who are indigenous to it call it? But it's the same with a Mozambican, a Maspiker. And recently I learned that the Manto speaking people in Durban used to call them the Masbekile. But it all alludes to that name that was possibly used by a farm keeper somewhere with a you know, we, we have it with musicant, maskandi, and we have these words ringing and echoing in our memories and the stories we hear. So our history is, is, is so embodied in us that we can talk Guma, but we also talk Mbatranga, we also talk Tricky Dry, we talk Post Gold, as we, we have heard about this Anglo, the anglo Boer War, the Orloch, the famous Orloch. And all these things lead to already a diverse South Africa. Uh, uh, that South Africa, uh, Vincent Colby says it himself, that apartheid was there to separate people because people were just too happy to be together. So we have this possible um, laws issue in America where people are talking about identity and they talk of the name, so-called colored, to be uh, taken out. It's derogatory. Others, um, they replace it with a term biracial. And it's, you know, it, it, essentially it's all God's people. But uh, is the God within us to see that? Some people themselves have been, um, have been called uh, Griqua, if they're light-skinned and they're closer. And it, it, it is, it, it, it's a question whether 
is it shame, you know, as Richard Rife writes in his book of Buckingham Palace, that we're not going to get the house because my brother is darker than me. And are we actually just going to be stuck there? Or are we going to say, you know what, my, my grandmother used to make pickle fish and she made great pickle fish and that's how I know pickle fish. I didn't have to travel to a certain part of South Africa and look for authentic pickle fish. It's already in my life. It has been there for generations. So what is our history when no one is watching? Thank you, Zippo. Thank you, thank you, Nabagazi. Thank you very much. Um, Atia, can we hand it over to you? Yes, hi everyone. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. So um, I contributed uh, two years ago, the article on Guma for the, the Art and Ubuntu Trust, which hopefully can be read somewhere. Um, basically taking it through from the video and then going a bit more in depth about uh, the history, talking a little bit about some of the enslaved history and then various musical influences. Basically for anybody who doesn't know anything, kind of like a compendium um, of how to uh, go about understanding this music. And I think uh, I'm, I'm very happy to have heard uh, Valmont's um, uh, comments and Zebakazi because I, uh, while writing the piece, I wanted to speak to Valmont and also because he, because of the, the work he had done. Um, but, be, but just to give you some background, I'm from Johannesburg and I moved to Cape Town to work as a journalist and had no understanding or exposure to Guma uh, basically my whole life, you know. And I think that there are, I'm not alone in this and there are many people in the country who might have a very similar experience. And the minute I landed in the city uh, in 2008, you could feel the energy of this music all around. And I guess it was something that over time, even now, 15 years later, I've still been trying to figure out what is it that captures this feeling. Um, it was very uh, sad for me and also warm to see uh, musicians I was close to, like Errol Dyers and, and Robbie Hansen um, on screen and, and just kind of thinking about the amazing musicians we have and have had um, who kept this tradition alive. And also with the younger generation of musicians who are continuing to draw influences uh, from the sound, including people like Carl Shepard, people like Benjamin Jeffter, um, a whole group of orchestras, uh, you know, the, the work of um, Hilton and uh, Hilton Shoulder and also Mac McKenzie. And it's ongoing, but also to Valmont's point about, um, I think making a very valid point because what I'm saying is that when I when I came to Cape Town, um, the feeling of this music was very much alive and around. You would hear uh, the Klopsa practicing in different parts of Cape Town. Um, and more and more it's becoming uh, decentralized. I mean, it's becoming more and more um, segregated. And the city has distanced itself from a lot of these tra traditions including things like the military choirs and um, uh, these certain music circles that are happening in isolation now. So there isn't really and um, bringing in of a lot of these uh, music styles into like the mainstream. It's always on the periphery. It's always in the community. And through my own work, I've had to try and you know, digging for this stuff, you know, in many ways, digging for music, um, trying to go to as many performances as possible, trying to speak to as many musicians as possible. So um, I think that is a big concern. Um, and then also I just wanted to add that from my other work as a DJ or selector or person who plays at events, uh, one of the things we try to do is also to play within our sets um, as a way to also keep this music alive in, in public spaces. So um, it's not just like, of course, we play all kinds of jazz or South African music, but make sure that there's also spaces for this to kind of be included also. 
Um, I want to also just um, those those are like some very brief insights, and I'm happy to send the article to anybody who wants to read it, or I'm sure it's online somewhere or available. Um, and um, yeah, chat more through questions. Also, I don't I don't have anything further than that. Thank you, Atia. Um, and thank you to all our speakers. Um, Dr. Valmond Lane, Nabok Gazam Nugwana, and Atia Khan. Uh, as Atia Khan has stated, uh, Atia contributed to uh, uh, an essay to a workbook on Guma music. All workbooks are available for educators, also for community uh, art center facilitators. If you're interested in, uh, in showing some of this work, um, the 15 part series, and also if you'd like to read uh, essays and contributions from uh, people like Atia and other writers, you have to contact us, inquiries at atanobudu.org. Um, now we'd like to give it to the floor. I would like to find out if there's anyone who has commentary on uh, what Valmont and Nabagazi and Atia Khan touched on, they touched on many things. Um, uh, and so if you have any commentary, you can raise up your hand and ask a question, or you could use the chat box on the side. I have a question. You, uh, Vermont, at some point you, you were saying that you have a book coming up and what you would like to look at is basically different strategies on how to speak about Guma music. Is there, do you have an example of kind of strategies that you think, you know, we should, you know, one should uh, look at when they're speaking about this music? Um, well, I mean, one of them, um, is I spoke about media. You know, the one can learn something about the music by, I guess, in the old Marxist tradition, and looking at the kind of materiality of the music, the the fact that, um, and Vincent uh, alluded to it in the film. Uh, people, slaves came here with music in their bodies, in their memories, their their own languages. Part of the violence of colonial conquest is to kind of force that out of the people, either through, I mean, through violence, literally, through beatings and forcing them to work, through suppressing their traditions and practices, and through enticing them, through enchantment. Um, that's why I talk about mythos, because uh, we can learn a lot. I mean, let me pose a practical example. I've always been fascinated by the fact that um, we talk about guma as this drum. Um, guma comes from the drum, right? Uh, and um, so we have this idea of deep in the midst of time, somewhere people used to play drums. But I mean, Vincent started to break break it down to say that there's there's a wine industry here and slaves are brought to work on the wine farms. It's labor intensive. And then you have this crafting, so slaves are taught to make barrels, wine barrels, and from that they, they learn to make drums. Um, so there's a story that, that is grounded in truth and in, in the material culture of the, of the people of the area around the drum. But there's also myth mythology. And I don't, again, I'm not using it in a derogatory way. I think it's, it's myths that enable us to, to live. And part of the mythology of Guma is that it's, this drum is based on this drum. And yet the problem is that you can't find, unless you, you research the subject, you can't find anybody, you know, if I ask our audience or anybody here who, who listens, who likes Guma music, who are the greatest drummers in the Guma tradition? You'd be hard pressed to find a name. But if I said, who's the greatest singer or guitarist, maybe you can find somebody. Um, you, can, you can think of... Uh, you know, all these famous, uh, the singers are particularly big in, in the Klopse tradition. There's Joey Gabriels, Tali Peterson, and so the, the list goes on. Why is that? I think it's got something to do with this the making mythology. So uh, I guess that's what I'm trying to do in the book is say, let's think about 
other ways of coming at it that don't involve identity. It's not because identity is bad. It's just that it's, identity has been the only thing that's been fed to us about this music uh, because it serves a certain purpose. So what Nebakazik or, uh, or uh, spoke, alluded to as a kind of divide and rule. Um, I like that, that quote and somebody posted in the chat about uh, where, what is our history when nobody's looking. Um, so le let's go look at at the at the ways in which our story is constructed and made up for us, um, and let's question it, not to not to reject it, but to learn something. Um, so there's uh, there's the drum and the story of of mythology that that I, I I can pose as an example. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's one way of, I guess, opening up the story and thinking about the possibilities that it, it offers us. Thank you, you answered me. I'd like to read from a chat. Uh, Bravosi made a commentary on the side. I would like to read out loud for everyone to see, I mean, to hear. Um, Bravosi says, as I listen to the pres to the presenters, I cannot but help to compare Goma to Askanda music in KwaZulu Natal, a music that opened up in the 1970s but had grown nationally to attract not only Zulu, but other South African language groups. Perhaps a tragic way for Guma to get footing in Eastern Cape, Northern Cape, and even Northwest because of, it, of the historic link. That's from Bravusi. Oh, sorry. Um, there are hands up there that I did not see. Thank you, Bravusi, from that comment. Uh, if somebody else would like to make uh, or to speak on your comment, they're also welcome to raise their hands. I will, Atia, can I start with you? And then Bridget, um, I see your hands are up. Um, I think Bridget was before me. So let Bridget go and then I'll go. Okay, Bridget. Thanks, I'll, I'll do a picture as well. Um, hello, everybody, and um, thanks so much for all the presenters. It was really, really interesting and moving to hear you all. Um, it was it was quite some time ago that that we originally filmed this footage, but it had such a um, powerful impact on us, and we we originally filmed it for another documentary that we felt it was useful to make as part of this educational series. And it's really great to know that um, it's you know that. The, the great Vincent, Errol, Robbie, that, that what they had to say still has, has meaning today. I'd like to talk a little bit about what I learned while we were filming, filming the material. And I think that the strongest thing that I learned is that this music is a form of resistance. Um, you know, what's quite central in the more piece is the story, the, the songs, um, is, is the question of parody. And I think parody is very important in carnival across the world. Um, as a form of speaking truth to power, of in humorous ways being able to, you know, uh, articulate your, your feelings and your thoughts um, about the master. And um, so, so that's really, really clear to me. And then something else that I found so interesting is when I was working in East Africa to discover that the word for a drum in East Africa is ngoma. And so that's an interesting connection. Um, uh, and and I also like to tell a story, I don't want to take too much time, but um, we had such interesting experiences while we were while we were making these films because we really got into the world of the Klopsa. Um, in order to film them, we had to be with them, march with them, go to, we went to practices and so on. And if you remember, there's the, a photograph has been coming up of a little boy playing the drum in, 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 in blue and white, along with some other older people around him. And when we first encountered that little boy, um, and this is, yeah, there he is. He was being trained by an older master drummer who didn't go out with the Klopsa the next day in, 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 in costume, but he was training them. So clearly there are master drummers, but their names are not known and they, they're not known. So that's obviously something for somebody to do some, some research on. But um, the, the last comment I, I want to make, and that also I'm also a student of Vincent Colby, deeply influenced by his passionate, fervent, consistent insistence that Cape Town was a mixed city, it was impossible to divide it, that South Africans were mixed people, we couldn't be divided. 
Um, and he always came up with so many brilliant historical examples. Like one of the things he really loved was somebody who led a protest in the late 19th century whose name was Abdul Burns. And Vincent Colby just loved that mix of names. But in our experience as well, when we when we when we had um, a premiere for the for the film that we made, um, um, our language, our music, our city, we had a premiere in Gugoletti, and we invited the Christmas choirs and the Malay choirs and the, and the Klopsa who we'd been working with, who who were called the Lentakia Entertainers, and various jazz musicians. Robbie was there, and so on. And when the Klopsa came, it was so exciting because one of the drummers in the Klopsa came from Gogoletu and he wanted them to march on the streets of Gogoletu um, to show his, his parents. And it was incredibly thrilling. It was it was a, a really beautiful experience. And then we discovered that the um, Christmas choir people who we'd invited um, came from Bontehevel and they also had these connections. So these are traditional so-called divides in the Western Cape, but in fact, it's, it's all very, very integrated. These are just to explain to people, people who might be signed in from other parts of the world and may not understand these differences, the so-called colored and African people would always be divided. And one would assume that the Klopsa is all part of the so-called colored community, but in fact, there were these deep connections and exchanges. There were also deep connections and exchanges between professional musicians like Robbie, jazz musicians, and and community musicians, they would go and play with them, um, you know, when the clubs were were preparing for their end of year um, street performances, they um, the professional musicians would go and play with them, um, and also some of our great jazz legends from Cape Town learnt from the clubs, from the Christmas choirs, and so on. And you find, um, you know, the international legend Abdullah Ibrahim he beautifully mends, melds um, the Guma rhythm plus Marabi, which was another mixed form um, of, of a particular, particular South African sound, which has been described by somebody as the golden thread underlying South African jazz. So if you listen to Abdullah Abraham, you can hear the Guma, you can hear the Marabi, and there's another, another um, beautiful mix. And just to end on this question of mixing, um, I, I, I share Valmont's um, comment about um, how it, the, the musical form, this important musical form and community practice, it's much more than a musical form, it's also a community practice, and how it's so vital to the city of Cape Town and it's ignored by the city of Cape Town. And like Atia, I uh, also came to live in Cape Town uh, uh, you know, as a young person um, and encountered the excitement of the rhythm. And like Nebakazi, I also had to you know dig beneath the layers to really access and understand the history and so one of the things that we were thinking when we were, when we were making this documentary is something that would be incredible which would overcome the physical apartheid divides which still do, um, divide communities would be to have a cross city choir competition so instead of having malay choirs having competitions on their own and clubs are having competitions on their own, or they still have the competitions on their own, but there would be one really prestige choir competition where every kind of choir in the city participated. And in that way, everybody would have to understand what makes a good Malay choir song, what, what makes a good clubs a song, and who really is the best, and gospel choirs and all the other choirs. So in that way, as a city, we'd have to get to know each other, all the musical forms that can be um, siloed because of the physical separations that, that do occur. Okay, that was my that was my um, two cents worth. Thank you, um, Zipo, for giving me the space. Thanks, Bridget. Atia? Um, thank you, Bridget. You I ask? think, yeah, yeah. No, I just wanted to, uh, just a very small comment, uh, but thank you. Thank you to Bridget because it's good to know. Obviously, in uh, my 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 connection is a, a bit crappy, so I'm just going to turn my video off. Um, I just wanted to say that, and maybe Valmont can like back me up on this since he did a whole PhD on it. But um, in doing some research in trying to tell the most accurate story that can be told 
because this might this this work is going into the hands of teachers who then need to pass it on to students. So there's a responsibility to try and be as accurate, as authentic, and everything as honest as possible. Um, I found that uh, there's a constant process of learning that has to continue to take place and maybe uncovering and unearthing because from the drum to the word, to the spelling of the words, the, the different spellings of the words, um, everyone has a different theory and they're all beautiful stories. And that's why you mentioned the word myth. But I can't say for a fact, Puma is this and it comes from this and this is its history. It's like it lies between this period it has these various influences. Um, so it, it, it's kind of like laden in myth because there's no definitive truth as of yet. Or maybe we there's various ways that it comes to be. Um, and and there we can point to certain things that that's, that kind of have influenced it and um, have allowed it to, to travel and move. But... Um, I uh, was digging it for records in Amsterdam and found some Surinamese uh, music. And they were, the minute I put it on, having never heard, it's a style of music, Kavina music, also carnival music. Obviously, the Surinamese with Dutch colony also um, organized by the Dutch. And uh, suddenly I was like, has anybody written about the, um, the similarities between what I'm hearing with this with this Kavina and what Guma that's that's suddenly what I wanted to read because uh, I think the influences are further than we've even like pinpointed it to. Um and so Valmont looking really forward to the, the, the book I can't wait. And my in my eyes there needs to be more scholarship, more interviews, more performances, more highlighting of the sound. Because like everything that young people do, they take all the influence and they they remix it into something fresh, you know. So so um, there should be more visibility in terms of these performances happening at the Cape Town st uh, Stadium that doesn't get used for anything really anymore. You know, like like how do we bring these things into uh, the different segregated parts of the city, basically? And beyond its borders, so it doesn't just—it's not just this Cape Town um, study all the time. That was a comment, right? Or Belmont, did you want to add? Or yeah, say sorry, something? it was a comment. Sorry, it was a comment. Yeah. Do you want to expand, if, if I may, very quickly, I just want to, uh, um, yes, support what Ati has said, but also just respond to what Bridget said earlier. Um, the the thing about Guma is also that it, it's it's in Cape Town, yes, but we mustn't forget that Cape Town is part of the rest of South Africa, and it's an. Uh, she, uh, um, Bridget made a point about Marabi that I just want to emphasize there's another question that I would have asked if I had more time and that's about how uh, what happened in the Cape travels to the rest of South Africa and even beyond that and there's a very fascinating story I mean again there's an example there's a word Urlams which if you live in Cape Town you know what Urlams means but somebody with an attitude problem or I don't like your attitude you, you, you Urlams but there's also people who are called Urlams Urlam and they live in different places. They're not confined to one racial group. There's Urlam who settled in, in Kimberley, in Johannesburg, and in Namibia. And they, you know, some of them are, are Griqua, uh, some of them are Black African people today. But what is the, the Urlam were basically people who traveled with the Trek bulls or who were kidnapped as children by the Trek bulls or in different ways became forced. When the Bura left Cape Town, they left because they couldn't get access to cheap labor anymore because they weren't allowed to have slaves. And so they went looking for cheap labor in other places. But they had people with them and those people integrated into, into society over generations. So uh, uh, there's this point about people who live on the fringes of the established categories and groups um, that became classified eventually over generations as colored but also became classified as black and, and other groupings. So 
um, it's interesting that um, we, we talk about Goma now as being fixed in the Cape, but the influence of the Cape is in that Marabi music, and it's there because people travel from here, also during the, the Industrial Revolution and so on. So just to say that the, this, when you think about this history, it's fascinating in all kinds of ways. You try to get away from the kind of established ways that we understand the music. Um, yeah, I guess I just wanted to emphasize that. Can I just come in uh, right after Vermont? Um, maybe there's something that we're missing. Yes, we may have um, centuries and centuries of of livelihoods happening, and we say other people used to fetch water from the well, other people open a tap, other people drink bottled water. But um, if we look at the links between the kuma and the wine barrel and the skin, those are all workmanship songs that we work better. So even in the plantations in Cuba, in all across South America, people were enslaved, they were allowed to keep their songs because it kept them happy. And that's why there's that whole thing in movies about the singing work goal and uh, are you singing, are you happy, are you singing, are you that, you singing at work, you know, are you absent-minded? And and even Hansen herself, who studies Kosa music, her first inkling to Kosa music is she's in Natal and an office and the people outside um, fixing the road and they're singing this song, to work in rhythm in Ghana, the migration communities of Volta who come down to the coast to fish they are known that they are Fanta people by the songs that they sing. So it, it is not to essentialize to say that if there's a drum in a culture, it must have come from before Jesus was born, like three millennials ago with the Jurassic Park. It's essentially to say that the song is embodied, the music is embodied within the people who make it. They remember it. And at times, they may remember it as a broken chord, as a broken memory. If you are in a ship, as I've said before, you get scurvy, you get amnesia, you get all sorts of sickness. But if there is a murmur in your head, you investigate where that song comes from. It happens also when people are going through traditional healing that they will have a song that is their song. It happens in the Christian church where people are gonna speak at church and someone sings their favorite hymn. So what is what is the relationship with man and music? You know, um, we can talk about all these musical styles his historically, but we are getting to what John Blacking was asking, how musical is man? Because every time we talk about music, we talk it in differentiation that, oh, an African child has got rhythm, they're lucky. Not all African children have rhythm. And we need to ask, like the example that is made with Maskandi, now that there is similarities, there's similarities with Chakni music, there is similarities with anything that makes a groove. So with Zulu people, they have the symbiotic relationship with cattle, that the cattle is slaughtered for ritual, it is made for, it, it is part of their clothing, it is what they eat, but they take that hide once in a while and they hang it on a tree and they put a stick through it and it's called the friction drum. We think our drum is something that you beat. The first one was a friction drum. So what was the friction drum for the koi? What was the friction drum for, for other cultures? Some cultures you find it, some cultures you don't find it. We are not trying to have binaries when we talk about different cultures. So we're not trying to fulfill and say, this is what my culture is. And that's what's happening in our classrooms. Our learners who may be Islamic and come from the Cape get asked that question, what is your culture? And they say, it's Islam. And we say, no, that's a religion. In other parts of the world, it is, what is their religion, is their culture. So we're not gonna find a neat packaging every time we're gonna go, oh, Bantu speaking people, we're gonna say, well, you know, stop calling me Nguni. I'm not Nguni, I'm 
I'm Bondomise and I'm not Tosa. Call me what I am and call me what I call myself. There, there's even still that fight to do for the indigenous that call me what I call myself. Don't essentialize me and put me in something and think now you know where what turns me on and off. So when we talk even about the music, there is a, a wave, like you say, with industrialization of music that came with people going to the gold mine. What were they singing? It's not only African people who are doing the gambo dance. Even this new ama piano, it's almost like gambo dance when they dance. Do we see ourselves in that and claim that part? Or do we say, oh, no, it, it like fell out of the sky? Thank you. Thanks, Ngabakazi. You know, there's someone I would really, really like to hear their input here. Um, I see the name is, a, you know, they have a name here, but I'm not quite sure if they're in the room. Is Abdul Kada in the room? He's one of the filmmakers. I would really, really like to hear his voice. Abdul Kada. Uh, let me call him. Hello, I'm here, and I Hi. hear all the, I hear all the comments, and I'm very glad. <clears throat> Well, the important thing is that uh, we are <clears throat> suffering the trauma and the several wounds of colonizations. But nevertheless, uh, what they call it, when we speak about culture, it's very important to understand uh, what they call it, <clears throat> as they have defined it previously. And my sister who spoke just now, she mentions that why culture is not something static. Is evolution, it evolves always. And that evolution brings new forms, revives old forms, but at the end of the, them, they have a root, and that is the root that we are discussing. So that is my only simple discussion. But the one thing that I found in proudly South Africa is that uh, they are <clears throat> in, in the training of uh, creating pillars of uh, expression. They say Zulu, Kosa, Nguni, da 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 But they never ever create the transversal element that makes them a society called South Africa. And that music makes South Africa. That's it. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Abdul Kaida. Uh, still have a few minutes left. So if there's anyone who has last minute, last words uh, to share with the group, um, if they have any questions about the film, to the filmmakers, one of them you just heard from, or from the speakers, uh, you're welcome to do so. Or we will wrap soon if there's anyone, if no one has a comment. Hi, Zipo. Yes. Yes. A, a question I, I wanted to ask is um, maybe to Valmont that he's, uh, he's been busy with a book also about the, the filmmakers. Um, we were talking about examples of where the music is now, for example, with the Amapiano uh, or other things like, for example, um, uh, how different artists nowadays also kept, like Kyle Shepard kept the music alive and the traditions alive. And I wanted to ask just the, the state of, of the, the, the Guma right now, just because the, the way I also, uh, let's say, experienced the first time when I, when I arrived in, in South Africa, it was 2005, I experienced the, the Guma through um, the music also. I think it was Future Cape, rock art, Future Cape of... Uh, Hilton Schilder, and there was also the music of, uh, what was the, uh, Alex van Gierden. And he had a nice reinterpretation almost of, of the music of the Guma, of the real dance music and all that. So I just was, inter I was interested to know where we are going with that uh, right now. Uh, 
Um, I, uh, if it's okay, I can try to answer that. I don't have an answer or a definitive answer, but I think you, you mentioned real dance. What's wonderful to see about real dance is that it's young people who are taking it up. There's a debate about whether it's authentic or what parts of it is authentic, which I don't really worry about that much. I think the important thing, as I said about myth making, is that young people in communities are taking this on as a kind of way of identifying something and they, it's a platform for them. Um, whether it's authentic or not, I don't really care. I, I care more that there's something that's driving a creative project inside a community that has a reference to the past and pe people can do with that and kind of reinvent their past as, as they want. That's what we all do all the time. Um, what's what's What I wanted to say also about Guma, I guess, is that the, the other myth that I want to work with is the fact that Guma is not only about the Klopser. There's the Klopser is only the biggest showcase, but there's a whole lot of other things that goes on that you can call Guma, if you like. Um, and by that, I mean community music and a kind of driving spirit in, in the music. Uh, one of the biggest drivers of Guma for me is, is dance music, is um, what we used to call Lang Aram music. And again, there's a story about the colonial encounter because um, Alex van Jerden's critique, if you like, or what he took up as an artist was this idea that um, there's this music, which you might call fastrap or tiki dry, as Nebakazi said earlier, um, is, is a Creole form, is a black idiom that got appropriated for white Afrikaner nationalism, and it became sanitized as Bura music. Um, but Alex's project was to challenge that and to and to in a sense open it up and liberate the music from that racial straitjacket again, that theme, um, and a lot of the driving uh, kind of rhythms that we associate with guma um, is probably more appropriately placed in that that kind of informal dance culture, the picnic. Um, in the book, I I talk about the kind of one of the mythical, the primal scene of guma if you like this the kind of idea we have in our heads of where it comes from is the picnic is the fireplace the, uh, you know the, the primal idea of the indigenous people and the, the magic that comes from storytelling and from other creative practices that arise from being in that place when you when you're at night and the stars are out in the sky you're at the beach you're hearing the roar of the ocean and you're telling stories through music or through dance or through some kind of integrated statement um so yeah i guess it's just to say that that's a, a general human condition that's always going on young people are inventing things now that we might not even know about that can that will become tradition at some point so if one thinks about it in the span of over the span of time um it's interesting to think like that because then one thinks about guma at a point in time in the late 19th century or the early 20th century it strikes or it's, it, it registers slightly differently uh, in the 50s, in the 60s, in the 70s, etc. Um, you think about it against the time in which it was, what did I have to cope with, whether it was the, in, the, you know, the, the invasion of rock and roll or the invention of jazz. Um, in relation to Guma, it's, there are always different flavors that are emerging. And so if I'm a piano and hip hop and other things are kind of picking up that energy now from young people, we don't know where it's going to go. It's kind of exciting to go and explore and, and think about that and to encourage young people to draw on those traditions, to make their own um, way with it. Yeah, thanks. Yes, thank, th thank you, Velma. Sorry, Zippo, to take over, but thank you, Velma, no, for I... that. It's really what Vusu was talking about, the costina. The role of the costina, whether it's Maskandi and it's um, Musim Shongo in her prime, or it is um, just a collective of old men in Stellenbosch playing Pura Musik, it's um, it's the same thing, you know. It's not for not in like in that way, and it's important that we do put it in an era of. 19th century, 20th century, and see then how far back we, we, we can go. And and one thing we didn't speak about maybe for, 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 for future is uh, the Amy and the church, the neo-apostolic church 
in current day, how much it's like a, a feeder for all the orchestras, all the music schools. And that started in Hanadendal. So today we're talking about Urlams, but I've I've seen conversations around Cape Town where people say, no, we're Elam. Once it's Elam. When 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 it's so called kind of people having an argument over something and they say, No, don't put me out like that. We're all the same. Once it's Elam. So it's a vast country, as you said. And our, um, you know, our future is not really cut off from our past. I'm sorry to speak in so many riddles today, but it, it, it's not cut off. And the search for it, whether it's five generations down, it will, it we will still have the same questions. So digitalization and documentation is important. And look at the movie we're critting today. I saw it quite a while back at a screening. And I thought to myself, why would they bring something? There are other Kuma movies. There's, there is something that has that has been happening, but it's that the wisdom is there. So we, we will always go back, like I guess people go back to their holy books. Thank you. Thanks, Nobagaz. There's a question on the chat. Uh, is there anyone who can answer the question whether through the chat or now live? That uh, Mac Mackenzie. Mac Mackenzie, is there a book out? Can well, someone yeah, I think Rafsi is asking about Mr. Mac, not Mac, like the elder. Mr. Mac is Mac Mackenzie's father. Um, yeah. Oh, there isn't any any uh, writing about him, but yes, he's an important person, an important figure exactly. to write about. All right, I think we've reached our conclusion for today, or have we not? If we have not, we we'll come back next week, right? Because we have B Jensen. It would be great if all of you can. Uh, Join us next week, and perhaps we can pick on, can continue this conversation. Um, Atia, you also wrote an essay on Robbie, right? Mm -hmm. um, yes, I did. Sorry, I'm just trying to get through Rex's comment here, um, which was a long comment. Um, I'll I'll have a look at it now, but yeah, I did I did write this on Robbie Johnson. Um, okay, but. I also just wanted to say something earlier, but we'll just wrap it up also just to say that um, in response to, I think, what Dalma was talking about, um, that the genuines as a study, like I come to learn about the genuines purely through listening, not having had the privilege of knowing these artists at the time or growing up with them, or it's literally through this idea of punk and um, like Guma and, and Punk, so reinventing itself through through that style, basically. And thinking about um, when Benjamin Jeffers is now off to Joburg and, and is uh, listening to Kwaito also, and then also using parts of his fam's roots to Guma. Um, it's all kind of, I can't identify, oh no, this is Benjamin doing Guma. It's like, it's kind of all mixing in. So I think that uh, there are, there are, it will always, as long as the music reaches and the knowledge reaches, it will always continue to enter sound and be reworked in a different way. I think. Um, and also, no one mentions that Satima B. Benjamin also had a lot of Guma in her music and she, and, and she was in New York um, and what it might have meant for her to think about the sound in that way with American musicians. Um, who didn't really have exposure to that besides, I guess, Abdullah um, so, and the exile community around her at the time. So um, in that way, uh, what what that sound would have meant, and no one talks about that in relation to that because we don't really have access to those albums because they were pressed on vinyl and they're not really being circulated. They don't exist. So um, just a little last few thoughts about... Uh, Essentially, broadening our vocabulary about who we speak about and like learning more and also trying to make the music a bit more visible, more accessible for other generations that are coming that don't know. Yeah. 
Thank you, everyone. Thanks for listening. Thanks for having me. I think also, you know, people tend to associate uh, Guma with with only carnival and not think that, you know, the formation of Guma before that, you know. Um, but I think the carnival is also a very important thing that keeps the music alive, you know. Hence, maybe why the city is very resistant <laughs> um, of you know, having the carnival being, you know, to engage with the city as a whole. Um, so, yeah, maybe we have a lot of work to do. But thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. Uh, it could have been anywhere else, but you chose to be here. So please remember that we're running these programs every Saturday for the next nine weeks. Uh, some are not on our mailing list, and I would love if you guys could join our mailing list. If you could go on the Art and Ubuntu Trust website at the bottom of the first page, just enter your details or email inquiries. Or if you have my number, text me. I'll send you all the invites. Um, and also, if you know any uh, people who might benefit on the, you know, on this 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 kind of a program, um, whether it's at Saturdays on on Zoom, or if it's the work material, the work material is actually amazing. Uh, Atia's essays there. There's like timelines there, a lot of uh, the script is there of all the films. So it's pretty, uh, a very rich workbook. Um, let me see, did anyone say anything? Okay, sure. I will add to our mailing list. Thank you so much, everybody. I hope to see you next week when we screen Robbie Jansen's film. <laughs>